A very warm welcome to all of you who've joined this evangelistic training clinic. It will be one of the most valuable things you have done as a Christian believer to equip yourself to be able to share truth. Remember to make notes and the handout papers are available. Contact me by email and I'll send them on to you. Let's go over to Pastor Alex Kurz of Shorewood Bible Church as he shares more in this lesson on evangelism. What do we do if they decide, not interested, I'm not ready, I completely disagree, or I completely reject? We want to continue to co demonstrate I'm still available. I I'm still here. I still want to maintain a level of relationship. Doesn't mean we're going to become intimate friends or anything like that. But, you know, that's okay. Um, maybe we'll have opportunity in, in the future. Uh, true life story. My father-in-law, he... Uh, in the beginning, when, when Sharon and I were first dating, um, he struggled, okay, he struggled, he struggled. And we went through it. And then out of the blue, one day, he, he called me. And there was an issue with family. Anyway, he called me, and he wanted to talk about the gospel. Now, I could have said, well, that's it. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you're a lost heathen, and I, you know, shake the dust off my foot. You know, don't, don't apply that passage in Matthew. I shake the dust off my foot because you rejected it. Uh, I'm going to continue to maintain a line of communication, all right? And you never know. That individual might face a tragedy. Who knows? Maybe a loved one dies. You know, I'll say, you know what? Can I ask you maybe some questions? I want to talk to you a little bit about this, you know. Anybody, you know what people, I, I mentioned this one tonight. There are three needs that every human being has. Number one, they want to be loved. Number two, they want to have meaning and purpose in life. And number three, they want to have a hope. You know what the gospel does? It satisfies all three fundamental needs that every human being has. A strong love. To know that the God of this universe can personally love me that intensely. You know, you start, you start to, to provoke their thinking. God, why would God love me? Strong love, significant purpose and meaning. Uh, you know, that's, that's sanctification, but also a, a, a strong hope. What, what does the scriptures do? It, it does tell us something about the hereafter, because deep down, the Bible says that death is the king of terrors. You know, our age group, my age, <laughs> their age group, last thing that they're really focusing in on death, you know how it is. Now, that doesn't mean an 80-year-old is dwelling on death either, but, you know, death is inevitable, and... Um, you know, there's, there, there's something about uh, the strong hope that Scripture, when the Bible says you can have eternal life as a free gift heaven, you know what? You never know. You just never know. So uh, a, a negative decision is a decision that we can and should respect. Yeah, John, real quick. Very good. John, for those listening on the way to the Internet, uh, John suggested that if somebody has a negative uh, this, uh, uh, response, they reject it. John's follow-up question, is it fair to ask, I'd like to ask you, why? What, what is it that would uh, cause you not to believe this? And hear them out. And hear them out. Okay, Very good. And be patient. Be patient. They have a right to reject. Because how many of you got saved the very first time you heard the gospel? Uh, Thompson, he was the great Sunday school guy. He, he, he did a sur su survey and study many, many years ago, and he said that, or he found that the average Christian gets saved after seven hearings and three touches or something like that. The average uh, believer doesn't trust Jesus Christ as Savior until after seven hearings. Ah, heard of this. I heard it from my mom when I was a kid, or I heard it when I went to Sunday school sometime. I heard it, uh, but see, that's okay. But that's a very good follow-up question that John would suggest. If they say, not interested, I, I can't believe it, uh, you're crazy, uh, I don't, I, what, what exactly? What is it? Well, uh, sometimes it's just too easy kind of a thing. Or, nah, I, I, don't, I don't believe all that kind of stuff. You know, that's okay. Hey, and you know what? Thank them. Well, I, I thank you for the time. I thank you for the opportunity. Man, I'd love, uh, maybe in the future, we maybe would have an opportunity to talk a little bit more, okay? It's okay. It's okay. Don't take it personal. When I was younger, I, I had a tendency to take it personal. 
Because, see, what happens is if the focus is on you, you're rejecting me. No, they're not rejecting you. What did Jesus Christ say to his disciples? Listen, the world, if they hate you, why? They hate me first, you know. So don't take it personal. This is God's message. We're just the messenger. And if we're faithful and true and accurate and precise and loving and so forth, uh, it's between them and the Lord, okay? Again, it's a spiritual uh, a battle that we're engaged in. So... Let's do this uh, for maybe the next 15 minutes or so before uh, we, we do it here. Have any of you begun to memorize some of those verses? There are some verses that were given at the end of each. There's a homework assignment after each. Uh, most students don't ever pay attention to the homework. <laughs> but there are some verses that um, we have given to you to at least have uh, kind of a, a very fundamental, you know, uh, base. Of, of information, base of, of verses and, and doctrine that you can share with a lost person. So before we actually have the encounter between me and, and the lost pagan, I'm just kidding, Ryan, <laughs> don't use terms like heathen and pagan and stuff like that, all right? Um, Paul says, and such were some of you. Remember that. It's always important to know. And, you know what? And such was I, okay? So in our own little campfire circle, we use that kind of language. Uh, I don't recommend you use it with lost people. But uh, I've always suggested to make things easy and simple, follow the Romans road. So let's say, you know, hey, I, I want to talk to you about the gospel and uh, I've got, you know, broke the ice and so on and so forth. So uh, what verses would you use to demonstrate, hey, you know what, we're all sinners. Now, Again, it's, it's easy to say, I want to show the person that he, she, you are a sinner. But to sort of alleviate kind of that kind of a direct, almost aggressive, it, sometimes, you know, we're all sinners. You know, if, if you're not just necessarily saying you're a sinner. Now, don't get me wrong. You are a sinner. But what does the Bible say? See, if a, a person kind of, wait a minute, you're coming across holier than thou, right? You ever hear people say, why don't you go to church? I don't go to church because they're all self-righteous, they're all holier than thou kind of a thing. Well, obviously you say, hey, you know that you're a sinner. Oh boy, all of a sudden a little defensive. But it would be gentler to say, you know, the Bible says that we are all sinners, you see? You know, let them drag you into it too, okay? Uh, Romans 3 is a great place to begin, right? Romans chapter 3. Have you memorized verse 23? Johnny? From the mouth of babes. See that? Uh, you're not a babe anymore. It is written. Well, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? Which, again, critical issue, establish a need. The first principle, hey, all have said. Now, eventually in time, uh, maybe you might have, you know, you might need to demonstrate all of us, all right? We're all in the same boat. And there are, I got verses, you know, a bunch of verses that emphasize everyone, all, regardless, doesn't matter. All have sin and come short of the glory of God. If you want to use the book of Romans, again, the Romans road, go to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, and notice there, Romans chapter 5. And verse 12, Romans 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sins. So we got two verses within uh, uh, two chapters three chapters, that tell us all have sin. So, Ryan, I mean... Um, would that include you? Now, now, according to the verse, according to the verse, would that include you? It includes me, obviously, but, but would that include you? Well, it does say all, no exception. It doesn't say all except, it's clear, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, do you agree that's what the verse says? Now, maybe the person isn't quite convinced, but... It's really not that hard to convince a person that they're sinners. Um, what we could do uh, using the Romans road. So let, let's say that Ryan, I'm just picking on Ryan. Ryan concedes, that's what the verse says, all. Would all include you, it includes me, it includes the Pope, it includes the President, it includes every human being. Well, so 
I am a sinner, and I'd like to demonstrate what the Bible has to say about sin. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. I'm just using the Romans road now, okay? Go to Romans chapter 1. And what exactly gets us into trouble here? In Romans chapter 1, we have a list of behaviors, a list of activity that, that constitutes and demonstrates that, that we do sin. Uh, let's begin at verse 29, Romans chapter 1, verse 29. This, by the way, is, is God's estimation of us. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud. Ryan, you ever been proud? Boaster, inventors of evil things? This one, this one nails it. Disobedient to parents. Ryan, have you ever been disobedient to your parents? Everybody's been disobedient. Well, according to this list, and also, by the way, you notice in verse 29, full of envy and what? Murder. Are you a murderer, Ryan? Have you ever murdered anybody? No. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Now, uh, this is where, if you want to demonstrate what Scripture has to say about some things, and, and for example, go to First John. Go over to First John. And look at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. And in 1 John chapter 3, here's a, a fascinating verse. Look at verse 15. Remember what that verse says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So you know what the point here is? Ryan, the verse does say all have sinned, but you know what? What's going on here? All has sin to come short of the glory of God. You know what the glory of God is? It's his standard of absolute perfection. And as far as God's absolute perfect standard of perfection, we learn that we all have hated. And, and, and that verse in 1 John 3 says, now specifically, he, he, whoever, he whosoever hateth his brother is a what? Murderer. So there's the glory of God. The glory of God isn't physically murdering someone. But if you hate that constitutes murder when you think about or when we compare ourselves with the glory of God. You see, God is that righteous. Um, go to Romans chapter 3, and I didn't really mean to jump over to First John, but it's interesting that in, in Romans chapter 1, there's a list of, of activity that you can demonstrate. I, I've, always, I've been disobedient to parents. I, I've, ex, I've uh, committed the sin of pride, boaster, backbiter. How about covenant breaker? You ever break your word? You ever make a promise to somebody and then you renege on it? You, you, that's what it means to be a covenant breaker. So, so the, the, the verses there are demonstrating that we all are guilty of committing some. And, and then, and then there's, the, the list gets even more uh, intense. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And again, we're, we're still over here dealing with the issue of, of who we are as sinners and, and what... Uh, sin is in Romans 3 verse 10 as it is written there is none righteous no not one there is none that understandeth there is none that seeketh after God they are all gone out of the way they are together become unprofitable there is none that doeth good no not one their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues they have used deceit the poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness their feet are swift to shed blood destruction and misery are in their ways and the way uh, of peace uh, have they not known there there is no fear of god before their eyes you know what you know, i mean that's pretty god says there, there's nobody good the Bible establishes guilt, and uh, that's what it means uh, to to be called sin. Now, now there are other verses that uh, we 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 can go to. Uh, go to well, go to First Corinthians chapter six. First Corinthians chapter six. Now, now these are some verses. Again, you, you don't want to teach quote theology. You don't have to dwell and um, again just hammer every single passage. Uh, if you just stick with the Book of Romans, that should be sufficient. 
But it's always good, again, to have uh, some, some extra ammo. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, look at verse 9. Uh, Rome, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit. I mean, that's good. Do, you, do you see yourself in this list? And I say, Ryan, have you ever committed adultery? Absolutely not. Ah, oh, wait a minute, we've all sinned and come short of the what? Glory of God. And, and you know what? I can, chances are, Ryan, you have committed adultery. I, we could go there to Matthew chapter 5. And what did the Lord say in Matthew chapter 5? If, if you lust in your heart, you've what? Committed adultery already. So I can, I can show a verse to Ryan saying, you, 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 I think you may have committed murder. If you've ever hated, some, hated your brother. Now, does it mean biological brother? Or does it mean... Mankind in general. But uh, the point is this. By hating, you can be guilty of murder. By lusting in your heart, you're guilty of what? Adultery. Colossians says, in fact, the verse here talks about being covetous. You know that covetousness is idolatry, according to Colossians chapter 3. So again, we're establishing the criteria that God establishes, and that's his glory. God wouldn't even think the thought. See, you know why we know we're all sinners? You don't have to commit the transgression. There's something wrong with us if we even think about it. Have we ever thought about killing somebody that offended us? Have you ever thought of, you know, in, in your imagination, you know, in retribution, boy, I wish that person maybe, we you know, would get hit by a car. And why would we think like that? See, there's something, it's called, it's who we are. It, it's, that's, that's our problem. Why would we think about coveting, having something that somebody else has? What possesses us to, to be proudful? See, there's something wrong inside of humanity. And, and, and that's what we're trying to establish with a lost person. Um, I'll tell you what, we don't, we don't need to keep hitting this stuff, but, but we could use, you know, the, again, establish the need. We, we've got a problem. Ryan, are you honest enough to admit that, hey, you're guilty of doing things. You're not, you, you, you know, you acknowledge you're not perfect. Well, of course... Uh, when we get them to that place where, yeah, uh, and I know what they do. They'll say, yeah, but you aren't either. I say, yeah, you're right. You're right. And that's okay. They always want to drag you with them, right? You know. And, and again, we don't want to come across holier than thou and sanctimonious or anything. Say, yeah, but you're, you're a sinner too. Yes, that's true. you're right. I know my heart. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm in the same predicament. I'm in the same boat as you are. The verse says, all oh, that does include me. Okay. So yes, the two of us. We're, we're all sinners, and, and we can find ourselves listed uh, in these particular passages. So what we want to now communicate, Rome, using the Romans Road, Romans 6, 23. Uh, hopefully you've memorized this passage, Romans 6, 23. We've already referred to it. For the wages of sin is, is what? It's death, okay? There's, a, there's consequences, Ryan, to, to sin. Sin merits death. Now, this is a verse you should all memorize. Has it, have you memorized Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27? I, I, don't, I should have checked to see. If, what does Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 say? It is appointed unto man once to die. Right? Ah, but what does the rest of the verse say? After this, the judgment. And after, the, after that, the what? The judgment. judgment. The wages of sin is death. Ryan, you, you concede. I agree with you, man. We are in trouble. We do commit acts of sin. We are not perfect. And we're all in the same boat. We're all guilty. The Bible says we're all going to die. Now, who in the world is going to refute that? But the more, the more important issue here is it is appointed on the man wants to die. And after that, there is judgment. Now, wait a minute. This is the reaction you might get. If you're dead, how can you be judged? What is in, in, in the typical response, in, in a common way of understanding death, is that all we are, all we are, are an animal, right? We're, we're just biological tissue mass, right? So most people, they, you'll hear an objection, well, wait a minute, if you're dead, you're dead. When you're dead, it's over with. So this is an area where we are going to have to stress that 
Again, death entails more than just physical death, more than cessation of, 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 of physical activity and physical existence. The Bible teaches that all humanity is more than just a physical body. And, and you, can, you can get those wheels turning and, and you can get uh, uh, someone to start thinking about that. Matthew chapter 10. Look, go to Matthew chapter 10. Here are a couple of verses that are, are very useful in pressing on that individual the reality, the truth. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to type these verses out for you, so that way you do have, quote, kind of a cheat sheet. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know what, Ryan? The Bible says... We're composed of more. We're made up of something more than just the physical body. The Bible says there is a part of us that is called a soul. That soul is who you are. The soul is that part of you that possesses those feelings and those emotions and, 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 the, and the personality. We're not just a piece of meat. And what sets humanity apart from the rest of the animal kingdom? I mean, surely you would agree that the human species is far removed, far different than the rest of... Take the next most intelligent creature on the planet. What would that be, by the way? Dolphin, maybe? I've heard dolphins or... C compare a dolphin with a human being. I mean, is there any comparison? You know what the... We are more than just a physical body. We're made up of a soul. And the Lord Jesus, the Bible says, don't fear the guy or the one that can destroy the, the body. Fear him that can destroy both body and soul. There's an invisible part of you. And, and you'd have to admit there is the way you think, that your wants, your wishes, your dreams, your aspirations, your likes, your dislikes. Well, what is that? Is that simply a, 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 a muscle fiber? Is it, is it simply nerves? That's what sets us apart. We're a soul. Go to Mark. Here, here's another one, that uh, Mark chapter 9. Now, now this one, now we're starting to turn up the heat a little bit. <laughs> Mark chapter 9. When the Bible talks about death, it's talking about the death of the soul. Yes, physical death. But it's the soul that can experience an eternal death. Mark chapter 9. And we read in verse 40, well, beginning at verse 43. Uh, Mark 9 verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that, sh that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. This is a fire that never goes out. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And then it's repeated in verse 48. And in verse 49, the Bible warns that the soul can face an eternity in a place called hell. And hell in the Bible. Then I go to Luke chapter 16. Uh, the, the Bible provides a description of the experience that awaits a lost person in this place uh, called hell. In Luke chapter 16, we can begin reading there if, without reading the whole parable in verse, or, or the whole, not, it's not a parable, verse 19, but if you drop down uh, verse uh, 22, and it came to pass that uh, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Look at that. He can see. Being in torments. 
and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in, in his bosom. And he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. So, so the Lord, he, he warns uh, about uh, fearing the one who can destroy both body and soul uh, in hell. And, and, and Mark 9 describes hell as being a literal place where the fire is not quenched. And here we have a description of an individual who in conscious torment is experiencing the consequences of hell. Revelation chapter 20. And then we go over to Revelation chapter 20. And, and, and now we read all the ultimate death, Revelation chapter 20. Again, it, it isn't so much arguing with the person whether it's real or not real. It's do you admit, do you concede that that's what these verses are saying, that this is what the Bible is saying? Uh, Revelation chapter 20. And of course, there uh, we read in, in uh, verse uh, 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things uh, which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's the eternal destruction of the soul, which doesn't mean annihilation. Just like that rich man in Luke chapter 16, lifting up his eyes in torments. Now, you can go back to Romans chapter 2. Remember there in around verse 8 and 9, where tribulation and anguish upon every soul. That what? <laughs> that, that uh, well, let's go there, Romans chapter 2. Uh, I need to refresh my memory. Romans chapter 2. Uh, verse 8, there awaits the sinner a place of literal torment. It's called the second death. And in Romans chapter, uh, uh, well, 8, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every, there's that word again, soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also the Gentile. What are the consequences of, of sin? Don't go there, but remember there in Revelation chapter 21, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire. But so, and, and there we go again. Wait a minute, you're a liar. I've lied. We've all lied. You know what we all face? We do face that second death, which is the, the eternal destruction, conscious torment of the human soul. That's what the Bible teaches, okay? Uh, you, there, there's going to be resistance. But, but wait a minute, we're guilty of sin. The Bible says there are eternal consequences to that sin. And it's the destruction of more than just the physical body. It's that invisible part of us called the soul. But, but you know, this is now where we transition to the solution. And if we go back to that Romans road, Romans 6, 23, yes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through a person, right? Through who? Jesus Christ Christ our Lord. And uh, obviously, um, the law, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verse 25, and this is, this is the ultimate solution. Romans 3, verse 24, let's read verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. The solution is the propitiatory... Now, you don't have to... You know, I'm not saying avoid that word propitiation, but most, I mean, 99% of the time people aren't, what in the world is a propitiation? Now, you don't have to, you know, have a grammar lesson, but if you want to just simplify it, it, it means he's that perfect sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. That, that Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, is set forth to be our sacrifice for our sin. So now we're beginning to uh, uh, focus and uh, uh, present the issues of the cross and, and all that Christ Jesus did and how it is that he did it on our behalf. 
it is our prayer that you would have learnt something that has given you more confidence in sharing the glorious gospel of grace. Until next time, blessings in the Lord and go read your scriptures. Bye for now. Thank you.